Do you want to do a countdown? Three, two, one. Um, Three, two, one. Meeting? Now, sorry, we're live. We're live. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to wait for the slide to come back up for me to get started. And I'm actually going to close my window so that people, folks, don't hear my neighbor's band playing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, greetings, everyone. My name is Edwina Martin, and I am the 2021 chair for the Staten Island Alumni Chapters uh, Virtual May Week. Um, and uh, I'm going to read a slide to you um, from our emergency response team uh, to get tonight's program started. Welcome to a town hall on ranked choice voting and redistricting hosted by the Staten Island Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. We are delighted you chose to be with us tonight as we kick off our May Week 2021 events. We want you to have a safe and wonderful experience. Please be assured that your safety as well as your enjoyment of the event are of our utmost concern. So please take a moment Look around and identify the nearest two exits, whether in this virtual setting, at your home, or physically in some formal venue, we must always be Delta ready. So please identify the two exits in your current location in the event it is necessary to evacuate quickly and orderly in case of the need for an emergency evacuation. Also, during this COVID-19 pandemic, please remember to wear your mask, wash your hands, and always stand six feet apart from others. Please enjoy tonight's event and continue to be safe. So as I said, uh, when I introduced myself, my name is Edwina Martin and I am your 2021 May Week Chair. May Week was created at the second national convention of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated in 1920 at Wilberforce University. Local chapters began to observe it beginning in 1921. The purpose of May Week is to emphasize the importance of higher education in the community, especially for Black women. A week in May is set aside every year for programs highlighting academic and professional achievement. Tonight, we are focusing on community engagement. As our theme, for May week this year is appreciating today, planning for tomorrow. I am pleased to turn the program over to our chapter president, Ms. Yolanda R. Scott. We'll tell you a little bit more about our wonderful little chapter that can, um, as well as some of the upcoming events that we have for you for May week and afterwards. And I will rejoin you at the end of tonight's program just to do some wrap up. So Yolanda, take it away. Thank you so much, Edwina, and good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Yolanda Scott, and I am the president of the Staten Island Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. It is my pleasure to bring you greetings and welcome you to this evening's town hall on ranked choice voting and redistricting, the second of our four free virtual May Week activities offer to inform and educate our community. I already know everyone will be provided with a valuable amount of information on these two very important topics and how it will impact you on your voting on this coming June for primary elections. Staten Island Alumni Chapter, one of the 1,061 chapters of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated has been providing our community with service and programming during our annual May Week activities since the chapter's chartering on January 20th, 1996. 25 years later, SIAC remains dedicated and humbled to serve the Staten Island community with fostering public programs and raising funds through fundraising events, which allows us to continue to offer and provide deserving Staten Island students are Melody Scott DeCure and Teresa A. Gallishaw scholarships. We thank you in advance for your consideration to donate 
and help our young adults. We have a few different ways to donate and the link and websites will be placed in our chat for your convenience throughout the evening. I hope that you will be back on Thursday, May 13th for our poetry night and groove to the latest tunes. On Sunday, May 16th, we will have our virtual scholarship celebration. And on June 6th, we will have an afternoon of enjoyment with high tea with the Deltas. All of these activities and more can be found on our various social media platforms, as well as logging on to our chapter's website at www.dstsialumni.org. Thank you to our special guests that have joined us for this evening for presenting their expertise and commentary. First, our moderator, Ms. Kimberly Peeler Allen, co-founder of Higher Heights America. Honorable Sylvia Brooks Powers, the first New York City Ranked Choice Vote Count winner for the New York City Council District 31 in Queens. My sorority sister and member of Queens Alumni Chapter. Dr. John Fatu, Fatou, excuse me, Independent Commissioner for Redistricting, and last but certainly not least of our special guests, Nicole Yearwood, an organizer for Rank the Vote New York City, a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sororities National Social Action Commission, and a member of New York Alumni Chapter. And to also thank the Staten Island Alumni Chapter members and their hard work the New York Metro Social Action Coordinator and SIAC's own Social Action Chair, Michelle Chungpung, our May Week Chair, Edwina Francis Martin, the Social Action, May Week, and our Technology Committees. Thank you again for joining us. And now I turn the program back over to my sister, Michelle Chungpung. Have a great evening, everyone. Good evening, all. Thank you, President Scott. Staten Island Alumni Chapter, we thank you for coming. Um, Staten Island Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated would like communities to understand what ranked choice voting is all about. How did it affect the special city race in February and be a part of redistributing political power and money? Our dynamics moderator for the evening is Kimberly Peeler Allen. Just a little bit about her. Kimberly has been working at the intersection of race, gender, and politics for over 20 years. Kimberly is the co-founder of Higher Heights, the leading national organization dedicated to building Black women's collective political power. From the voting booth to elected office, I am so happy to be a founding member of Higher Heights. <laughs> she is currently a visiting practitioner at the Center for American Women in Politics at Rutgers University, where she has served as an advisor on the election 2020 analysis and guest lectures in various graduate and undergraduate courses. Kimberly serves as the board chair of the ERA coalition, co-chair of Higher Heights for America PAC, and is a board member of the Fund for Women's Equity and NARAL Pro-Choice America Foundation a powerful quiet storm, sister in the movement. Here's Kimberly Peela Allen. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you so much to the alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta on Staten Island. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you and a particular thank you to the Social Action Committee for pulling together today's event because I think this is, a, we are in a moment uh, in our city, in our country, where we have uh, an opportunity to have our voices heard in a way that we haven't had it before uh, per around ranked choice voting. And we have an, uh, an opportunity to really understand uh, the impl implications of census on what it means for our communities and the redistricting and what that means for resources moving forward. And then to hear firsthand from someone who has been at the forefront of both of these efforts, uh, in, it will be a really 
great opportunity today. So it is my uh, pleasure to be moderator for this panel. I have worked with each of these individuals uh, in my, my 20 plus years of working in New York politics. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. So just a, um, a couple of housekeeping notes. We are going to leave a little bit of time at the end of each presentation for just some uh, quick follow-up um, questions, but we really uh, encourage everyone to put your questions into the chat and we have a, a bulk of time at the end uh, after all of the presentations because I think they all kind of uh, interweave with each other uh, for uh, conversations from the audience. So you can put them, whether you are on Zoom or uh, on Facebook, you can drop them into the chat and we will uh, include them in the conversation at the end. So uh, to get us started, we're going to talk about the ballot and how do we cast our ballot this year? Uh, let's start with the primary is in June. Uh, historically, this uh, this municipal election has been in the primary has been in September. So June twenty second is primary day in New York City, and we are taking on a brand new way of voting uh, in New York City: ranked choice voting. And to bring uh, to inform us on how that works, what your ballot is going to look like, and why all of this is important, why we did it in the first place, is my dear friend, Nicole Yearwood, who is a consultant for Rank the Vote NYC. She previously worked for the Manhattan Borough President's Office, and for the last two years has worked to inform communities about the plans for the 2020 census. In 2015, she, found, she founded EducatedVoter.net, aimed at fostering civic participation, Nicole shares nonpartisan voter education information on social media platforms and provides civic education services. So she, like I said, I've been working with her in this space for a really long time. She is the one who can uh, walk us through this process and rank choice voting. And with that, welcome, Nicole. Thank you so much, Kim, uh, Dr. Flateau. Selvina, or should I say Council Member Brooks Powers. Uh, good evening to my soul wars of the Staten Island Alumni Chapter. Thank you for having us this evening and for having this important conversation. Before I share my screen, I'm going to drop a link in the chat. You all will be able to rank your favorite Asian noodle in honor of Asian American Heritage Month. The link is going to direct you to a site that asks for your name and email, but you can put any characters in those fields and then hit submit and you'll be directed to rank your favorite noodle dish. We only had, we were only able to use a couple. So hopefully you'll see something that you like there, but you will be able to rank up to five. And then we're gonna go to this uh, mock election later on during the presentation. And so with that, I'm going to share my screen and let's get to it. So, ranked choice voting. So just a recap on what's going on with our elections in 2021 and how we got here. So, how did we arrive at ranked choice voting? So in 2009, and I'm sure many of you on this, uh, definitely my panelists remember, when we had a very expensive and a very low turnout runoff election for public advocate and comptroller. And that actually sparked the debate in 2009 about the merits of runoff elections. In 2010, then council member Gail Brewer introduced the first ranked choice voting bill. In 2010 and 2018, the New York City Charter Revision Commission, they kind of looked at ranked choice voting, but determined they needed a little bit more time to make a decision. In 2019, the New York City Charter Revision Commission voted 14 to 1 to place ranked choice voting on the ballot before New York City voters. And about 75% of the voters in the November 2019 general election voted in favor of ranked choice voting. It was scheduled to go into effect in 2021. And now we are here. So why are we here? So in 2021, we have term limits that have taken to effect. We're going to turn over our entire municipal government, our mayor's term limited, 
comptroller. We have a re-election for public advocate. 35 of the 51 council members will be term limited out, as well as four of our five borough presidents. In addition to that, we also have a very robust campaign finance system where New York City contributions are matched six and eight to one, depending on what you decide. And that led to a ton of candidates who decided they wanted to throw their hat in the ring for an opportunity to represent us in our city government. Now, of course, using the previous method, you risk splitting the vote with so many candidates in the race. Under our previous system of voting, where a city council member could win with just a simple plurality or meaning whoever gets the most votes wins, you can have someone winning when you have eight, nine, 10, 11, in my case, 14 people running for city council, you could have someone win with about 20% of the vote. But what that means is that 80% of the district voted for someone else. And so here we are at ranked choice voting. So what is changing exactly? As of now, right now, it says January 1st, 2021, so we are here. Local and primary, excuse me, local primary and special elections for city council, borough president, public advocate, comptroller, and mayor are all ranked choice voting elections. You are now able to rank up to five people, including a write-in. Runoffs are completely eliminated and candidates will need more than 50% in order to be determined the winner of an election. So election day, as we said earlier, primary election day is June 22nd. Early voting begins June 10th and runs through June 20th. The last day to register to vote is May 28th. The last day to change your address if you're already registered is June 2nd. And of course, on election day, June 22nd, polls are open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. So what is ranked choice voting? So you see on the right of the screen here, a sample ballot. So let's talk about it. We see five columns. We have the first choice column. The first choice column is your number one candidate. That is your favorite candidate, the candidate that you love. But what do we mean by that? If you don't have a friend or relative in the race, you don't love anybody who's running. But when we say the candidate you love, we mean that person who aligns with you on the issues that you care about. How do you feel about education, criminal justice, housing, climate, women's issues? So that person who aligns with you on all the issues you care about, that's your first choice candidate. That's your favorite candidate. You may give them a contribution, even volunteer on their campaign. And when you go to vote in June, you're gonna look at this first choice column and you're going to select the oval that corresponds to the row. So for this exercise, candidate C was the favorite candidate. And you can see in the first choice column, the oval is shaded in that corresponds to that row C. And so that's how we know that's the favorite. Now, your second choice candidate. So we say that's the candidate you like. Now, this is the candidate who may also align with you on the issues. May not be your favorite, like your first one. May not be your friend, but they align with you on the issues. In the event that anything happened to your first choice candidate, this second choice is a solid backup to that candidate. And we see in the second choice column, the oval that corresponds to candidate B is shaded in. That is the second choice candidate. Now we have the third and fourth choice candidates. You may not like them as much as your first and second. They may not check off all the boxes, but they check off most. And so in this exercise, we have candidates E, third choice, and candidate D, who was the fourth choice candidate. And then we have the fifth choice. Now the fifth choice candidate in this exercise is candidate A. This is the candidate where, again, not your favorite, but they check off a few boxes for you and you know that your district will be in good hands if they were elected. And so for this exercise is candidate A. 
And so here we have another little video that's going to teach you a little more about ranked choice voting. Hi, I'm Mahir, and welcome to my bodega. As you may know, New York City has a new way to vote in special and primary elections. So how does ranked choice voting work? The next time you vote in a city election, instead of choosing just one candidate, you can rank them all from your first choice to your fifth. Here's how it works. Let's say my bodega is picking its featured snack of the month. So many choices. Which one should I feature? This customer ranks Parker Pretzels as her top favorite. She also ranks her second choice, Mr. Chips, third choice, Chichi Chicharrones, fourth choice, Gladys Gummies, and fifth choice, Puppy Popcorn. Other customers rank their choices as well. If Parker Pretzels is a favorite choice and wins more than 50% of all the first ranked choices, then Parker Pretzels is the winner and is featured as the snack of the month. However, if no snack gets more than 50%, then the least popular snack is eliminated. Sorry, Figgy Bars. The remaining second ranked choices from customers who chose Figgy Bars are redistributed. So if customers chose chips and chicharrones as second choices, then those two snacks receive additional votes. The new totals are counted and the process repeats until there's a winner of the final two. Congrats, Poppy Popcorn, you're the bodega snack favorite. Back in the real world, before it's time to vote for humans, visit rankthevotenyc.org for more information. Thank you, New York City, for voting and for making these special and primary elections your elections. So before we look at the ballot, or get an idea what our actual ballot's going to look like, Let's check the results of our ranked choice voting mock election. So 422 votes have been cast in the election. 212 votes are required to win because we need more than 50%. So we see here round one is basically all of the first choice votes, the tally of the first choice votes. So we see here, no one has the 212 votes or the majority required to win. Japanese ramen is in the lead with 104 votes. Beef noodle soup is in last place with 17 votes. So now we're going to begin counting rounds. And what counting rounds means is that the uh, candidate in last place, their votes will be they will be eliminated and their votes will be redistributed based on how each voter identified their next choice. So for instance, beef noodle soup is going to be eliminated. These 17 votes are going to be redistributed, not randomly, not to the person in the lead, but based on how these 17 people who selected beef noodle soup as their first choice who did they pick as their second choice? And so we're going to keep going through this process of elimination until we have a winner and the top two candidates. So look, let's watch. So we see here, this is gonna keep going. And so we're going to go round by round. And again, these votes are being redistributed based on the choices on the ballots of those. So we see here 233 votes. Japanese ramen is the winner. Pad Thai came in second place with 160 votes. And we have 28 votes that were exhausted. So what do we mean when we say that we have 28 exhausted votes? So the 28 exhausted votes means that only 28 people did not have Pad Thai or Japanese ramen on their ballot. So out of 422, most people selected one of the top two candidates. So here we have our sample ballot. So all of us, for our purposes in New York City, all of the ranked choice voting elections are going to be on the same ballot. They're going to be kept together. Now, mind you, we only have five offices. So for instance, if you know anyone who's in Manhattan, like myself, 
we have a district attorney's race. That's not ranked choice voting. That is going to be separate from the ranked choice voting elections. So let's look at comptroller. So let's say Hayden Ramirez is my favorite candidate. I'm gonna go to the first choice option. I'm going to select the, I'm gonna shade in the oval that corresponds to the row that corresponds to Hayden's name in this first choice option. And so I'm gonna shade that in here. Let's say Bailey Walker is my second choice. Again, I'm gonna go to the row, I'm gonna go to second choice, I'm gonna shade in this oval. And then of course we have three candidates. So we have Rio Stevens, they could be a third choice or not, but this is how our ballots are going to look. Now we have many more candidates who are running um, for many of these offices. This is just to give you an idea. So why should voters use their rankings? So of course, using ranked choice voting is going to give you more choices. You're gonna have more options on who you can select. So you may have a favorite person. You also may know two or three people who are running. In this instance, you can actually select multiple candidates. It is also going to give your ballot more power. Now, what does that really mean exactly? So let's think about that mock election when we saw the beef noodle soup was in last place. I'm sorry if you chose beef noodle soup, but if you chose beef noodle soup and you didn't rank anything else, your vote would have been exhausted. But let's say you ranked beef noodle soup, then you have four other options. So even if your favorite candidate didn't win, which was beef noodle soup, you still had a say in who was ultimately elected to the office. Now, you can also vote your conscience without worrying that you are wasting a vote. You may know some people running in a race. They may, and we've all had this experience. I know my panelists, where we have an underdog candidate, right? You now can rank the underdog candidate and you can rank other people. You have four other opportunities to select somebody. So you don't have to say, oh, that person's not gonna win. I'm not gonna vote for them. You can give that vote to that person. And if they're eliminated for any reason, then your vote will go to your second, third, fourth, or fifth choices. The other thing though, is that ranking a candidate will never hurt your favorite candidate. And I'll explain why a little bit later. Now, here are some, here are some frequently asked questions. How many candidates do I rank? So you can rank up to five candidates or you can rank up as few as you like. You can still vote for one if you want. You can rank two, three, or four, but maximum is five. Do I have to use all five rankings? You do not have to use all five of your rankings. Your vote will still count if you go in and you rank one candidate. You rank two candidates, three candidates, or four candidates. Can I rank a candidate more than once? So it actually doesn't help them to rank a candidate more than once. There's no super voting or bullet voting in this case. And I'm gonna explain a little bit more. It'll make sense to you when we get to this next slide. Does it hurt my favorite candidate to have a second choice? So when you really understand how RCV works, it doesn't hurt your first choice or your favorite candidate if you have a second, third, fourth, or fifth. And this is because we will only go to your next candidate. So we only go to your second, third, fourth, or fifth choices if your first choice is eliminated. So when we talk about doing that bullet voting, if you are continuing to give your choices to the same individual, you're actually sending your vote to someone in theory who might be eliminated because we're not going to go to your next candidate unless the previous one has been eliminated. So let's think about the mock election again. If you chose Japanese ramen <coughs> as your favorite noodle, your vote never went to your second choice noodle because Japanese ramen stayed in the race. The same is true if you chose Pad Thai. Pad Thai stayed in the race. Unfortunately, it did not win, but it did stay in the race the entire time. Your vote would stay with Pad Thai. So your second, third, fourth, or fifth choices were never looked at 
because you selected the winner. So what do we need to know? Just a quick recap. Starting right now, New York City voters will be able to rank up to five candidates for the local and primary, excuse me, primary, local primary and special elections for the offices of mayor, comptroller, public advocate, borough president, and city council. And of course, voters can still vote for one person if they want to. Now, the other thing to remember though, your vote will only work as hard for you as so far as you rank. So I say to people, it's almost like if you wanna stay in the game, you need to rank in the event that your favorite candidate for some reason is eliminated. If they don't have enough votes when the election goes to rounds and they're eliminated, you wanna have a ranking there so your vote has some place to go and your vote will not be exhausted. You also don't have to worry about wasting a vote. You don't have to be concerned about helping someone you don't wanna support. If you don't wanna support that candidate, don't rank them. We're not saying rank people who you don't like. If you don't wanna help someone, don't rank them at all. You also don't have to worry about splitting a vote. If you know multiple people in the race, you can rank them accordingly. Last but certainly not least, moving forward, anyone elected to our local offices, to our municipal offices in the city will now be elected with a majority of support from the voters in their respective districts. And so with that, I will conclude. I will drop contact information in the chat as well as the website information and my email address. And now I can stop sharing and take a question or two. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was really, really informative. I um, wanted to ask, uh, I have two questions that, um, you know, that came to mind while you were talking. Like, you know, this, are there other places in the country that use ranked choice voting? Or is this something that New York came up with on its own? Great question, Kim. We have, I think there's about 16 or 17 cities that are using ranked choice voting now. And even in the last couple of weeks, I think Austin, um, Texas voted for something to put RCV in effect and Lansing, Michigan as well. There are also about three or four states that use ranked choice voting. Right, so we're we are we're not pioneers in this. No, we are not pioneers. We are not alone. Um, there are definitely some other places across the country, and like I said, a few cities, several cities. Uh, I want to say also, I think St. Louis, where um, another member of Delta Sigma Theta just won um, the election for mayor, uh, Mayor Jones, coming in. It was also ranked choice voting uh, election. So it's it's not brand new. It's new to us, but not new to the country. Or to the or to the world for that matter. Thank you for that. And then one other question, which I think is a good segue into our next speaker. Um, what? How? You know, we. You know, in New York, we definitely have like the voting blocks. We have you know our ethnic identities, our you know neighborhoods in the city. How does that? How does ranked choice voting either? Uh, you know, amplify the power of those votes or it doesn't dilute? Uh, because I think I, that's definitely a question that I've heard from a lot of people that ranked choice voting actually hurt, uh, you know, communities of color who have historically rallied around one particular candidate. And, you know, would love to get your thoughts on that. So I, I'm observing my personal opinion to see how it goes here for us in New York City, but studies have shown in other places that it has helped candidates of color as well as women um, get elected. So the studies have shown that it's had a, it's had a positive impact on communities of color and women and that more women in communities of color and members and people of color have been elected as a result of RCB. Wonderful. That is that is great to hear, and a perfect segue into uh, a person of color and a woman who was just elected by ranked choice voting, Council Member Sylvina Brooks Powers. And I just love the sound of that, Council Member. Um, 
to introduce the council member. Uh, she represents the 31st district, which includes the communities of Avern, uh, Brookville, Edgemere, Laurelton, Springfield Gardens, and Far Rockaway. She was elected uh, in a special election in February of 2021. Uh, a fierce advocate for equity and in, in, in city resources, Council Member Brooks Powers helped to secure $95 million in, rest, in restoration to the fund for the 116th precinct, expand the Cure Violence Program into the 105th precinct, and established a permanent COVID-19 vaccine site. As a community organizer, the council member drove uh, high impact in initiatives uh, on critical issues such as in, uh, including education, voting rights, and empowerment, and racial and economic justice, relief for efforts post Hurricane Katrina, MWBE opportunities, and women's rights. Uh, those of you who may have been in or around the labor movement over the last few years all probably also have seen Sylvina and her work in the fight for 15, uh, raising the minimum wage in the city and the state of New York. Uh, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce the newly minted council member from Queens, Sylvina Brooks Powers. Thank you so much. I really need to take you everywhere with me, Kim. You make me sound so good. <laughs> but it is such a pleasure to be here and be a part of um, the Staten Island Alumni um, Town Hall this evening. Uh, always looking to support my sorors. Um, it's great to be here joined by um, my Sora Nikki, as well as Dr. Plateau, who I've known for my years in the Senate, and it's so great to see you, Dr. Plateau, as well as um, Kim, who has really been leading the movement to helping to get women elected. And I think back to when, you know, we were holding these um, small forums in Southeast Queens trying to get women to want to run for office because for me, it, it, it's really important to make sure that we have that diversity and inclusion in terms of who represents us. And um, so I was asked if I want to talk about ranked choice voting and I guess my experience with it, um, being um, able to talk firsthand about that experience. I often start by telling people about the fact that this was not my first experience with it because in working in the labor movement, I had the opportunity of working in the Bay Area in California. Um, and there were uh, elections happening out there that were ranked choice voting. I, I worked with the mayoral campaign, which was ranked choice. And that was actually my first time experience in it. And even then it kind of was hard to see who the front runner was because there was a number of candidates there um, nearby from San Francisco was Oakland's mayoral race where there was someone who everyone viewed as like their number third choice that um, ended up emerging as the winner. And, um, you know, when the situation happened with Oscar Grant, I remember people being so up in arms, like this wasn't even the first choice because it wasn't who their perceived front runner was. So I've always been in total transparency, a bit um, concerned about that. But in theory, I think, to um, Nikki's point earlier, the, the theory behind ranked choice voting is to ensure that we are able to elect someone who's reflective of a community, who um, also can build coalitions across coalitions, um, which shows the roots in the community. And I think it's very important because there have been elections where um, people have been elected by very small margins um, and you know, it's a winner take all. Um, for me, I would have loved to have had a uh, had the results much sooner than I did, but it was all a part of the um, the process. It was definitely an exciting time to kind of see it play out um, in itself, also. Um, and I would have loved to have seen at the time more vote education. So I think it's great that the city is now investing fifteen million dollars towards um, voter education. Um, just in general, so that voters understand what the new voting system is, because in fact, it is law, right? And so this is how we vote now. And so we need to 
be able to understand what that process looks like, what that means. Um, and, you know, what we always kind of push even from um, the perspective of um, social action from Delta's perspective, we often want to ensure that voters are educated about who they're voting for and why they're voting for them. And so now it just gives you a couple more options to be able to select from. And so instead of going with just the one you know, this gives you an opportunity to really learn more about other candidates and what they bring to the table. And it gives you the option, right? So you can either vote for one person or you could vote for two, three, and up to five. And so it gives you that choice um, to do that, which is, is good. And so in my own race, what I saw was on election night, I was in the, in the lead that night. I was in the lead by, I think about like 200 and maybe 70 votes. And um, since once they started doing the ranking out, like the counts of the, the ranked ballots, my lead expanded. And so I think the, the lead expanded to about like 1300 or so. And so that was interesting to look at as well, because in 2013, we had a similar situation where it was a special election also. And the front two runners were very close. And it was only, I think, 80 votes or something like that that separated them and it was a very close call with um with the results of that race and so this kind of expanded that lead and what it looked like and so um it is is definitely something we have to continue to educate our community with because a lot of voters are, are, are you know accustomed to how they vote and change requires persistence and education and so um you know, I'm very happy that we're having this platform to really talk about it. We'd love to ask you a little bit about, um, you know, how how was campaigning as a candidate running in rank choice voting, and you've been in and around campaigns for most of your career. Did you do you feel that it changed the way uh, or the tenor of the campaign? Now that's a very good question. So I actually uh, ran for office back in uh, 2013, again, in the special election that happened beforehand. And um, I will say it was a very different feeling this time. One would say ranked choice brings out, um, you know, people wanting to work with each other, you know, and build coalitions and, you know, play nice in the sandbox. And that was not my experience the whole way through, quite honestly. Um, I felt that the campaign in um, 2013 was not as negative as it was in this last race. This one got very negative in total honesty. I mean, we had forums where uh, organizations had to close off the chat box because it got very negative. And um, so that was that experience. But in terms of how I campaigned, I, I campaigned pretty similar. The only difference is that I had to add the layer of voter education. So I, appeal, I worked to appeal to everyone. In 2013, I worked to appeal to everyone in 2021. And um, the difference here is that people had more options to vote for. So if they didn't know who they were voting for, hey, would you count me as your number one? But if they had their person in mind, I was not in the space of trying to change their mind. I was trying to be their number two. And I think a lot of voters appreciated that because some voters don't want you to tell them who to vote for. And when you have that approach, it's like, okay, yeah, I could consider you. There were some people that even said, because of how you approach me, I'm actually gonna think about you strongly and you could potentially be my number one, but you'll be the one or two. Um, and so I think from a voter perspective, they appreciated having that option. They appreciated getting that space to decide um, and me not being aggressive, like, oh no, you should vote for me as the number one anyway. And so that wasn't the approach that I took in this. Um, and again, a diff in terms of the voter education, what I um, set out to do was on my posters, all my posters had QR codes that brought you to the website that educated you on what is um, ranked voting. I, I dedicated an entire mailer um, to educating voters 
what is ranked voting and what the ballot looks like. Um, and then my palm card towards the end had that also once I knew what the ballot layout was going to be. And then same now going into the, the June primary, because I'm for re-election again, <laughs> we have a palm card that also has a picture of the, um, the ballot on it. And so that is a, a difference in how you have to campaign because there's an element of um, voter education. And um, again, in the special election, there was not a lot of resources being put to it. The city did not put money towards it like they're doing now for June. Um, the civics tried their hardest to um, do what they could to educate the community. So they had, we have a district leader in the community, Richard David, shout out to Richard David. He would be the one like kind of doing these presentations before the meetings, but um, you know, in terms of what the presentation would be like, if it, Nikki would come rank the vote, we only had a few of those and that was closer to the, the finish line. And so it didn't really give enough um, runway to the election to be able to, to educate the voters. Yeah, that's that's critically important. The the ability to educate and inform and which is I'm just so glad that that tonight's conversation is happening. Um, I wanted to bring uh, Nicole back into the conversation. Um, you had a, a question. So actually a comment, um, the presenters, it's a little glitch that happens sometimes with the deck I'm noticing in Zoom. But um, something you said reminded me of the slide because I was like, I think I skipped the slide. And then something you said reminded me um, when you spoke about the length of time that it takes to actually find a winner. And so and that reminded me of the slide because we talk about the counting of the rounds. So it's actually not ranked choice voting that delayed the elections. It's the fact that we have to wait until absentee ballots come in. We have to count all affidavit ballots, early voting and election day before it is determined who is actually, how many of the first choice votes, right? So for instance, with the Queens Council District 24 race, even though Jim Gennaro had 59%, it was not called until those absentee ballots came in and those were counted and then he was finalized at the winner, especially because of the pandemic. Now we have a lot more absentee ballots that are out, but those can be mailed as late as election day and the board of elections gives them two weeks to come in. But actually when all the votes came in, it took maybe a day and a half or two days to actually do the rankings after all the votes were in. So that was really due to the um, the absentee ballots. And um, the other thing on that slide I'll just mention is that in New York, we're always going to count to the top two. So it's not going to stop when someone reaches that majority mark, it will continue to go until they reach the top two candidates. But it's very important that we know all of the votes must be counted before we determine if someone has that hit that more than majority mark. And if they do, there are no rounds of counting, the election is done and there is no, and it won't, we won't look at rankings at all. Thank you for, for that clarification. Is that I think that's really important. You know, as we saw in 2020, uh, how long it took to count all the ballots and you know, the, the thoughts around why is this, is this abnormal? We're counting every vote, making sure every vote is heard. Um, and I will just uh, close out with the council member with uh, one last question. Having been elected by ranked choice voting and knowing that um, you know, it was truly the, the full district um, you know, or the majority of the district that, that supported you, um, how do you think that has may may or may not have changed in in real practical terms how you lead as as a city council member? I mean, for me, whether it was the ranked choice voting or the old voting system, I have always been of the mindset that as an elected official, you now have to. Um, govern right and you're supposed to govern everyone 
and you put the politics behind you. So whether it's ranked choice voting or winner takes all, I don't think it necessarily changes anything. Um, my district has a lot of needs and I just wanna, and, and it's an extremely diverse district. And so it's really about the service, right? That's what it's about at the end of the day. And I think that's the mindset that any candidate should really have going into um, running for office. And then, you know, once they win, that should be the mentality. So I've, I have not viewed it differently. Excellent, excellent. Well, I, we all wish you all the best in your reelection uh, and your continued leadership as uh, you know, we, you know, as we look at the number of women that were termed out in the city council uh, this year, it is um, really reassuring to know that, that we've, we've got you uh, and hopefully we'll be sending you back uh, to make sure that women have a seat at the table. Yes, and we need more. So there's some amazing women running for office. Um, so for those who are viewing, like let's get out there. It requires, you know, donating and volunteering, but we have to do our part to ensure that we are helping other women get elected. Absolutely, absolutely. I now want to, now that we've talked about, you know, how to vote, what it is to run as a candidate, uh, you know, the next piece is redistricting. And I remember having conversations in, in forums similar to this with Dr. Flato 10 years ago um, after the last reapportionment, uh, because it is so critically important and, and leading up to reapportionment, I was doing forums with, with Nicole around making sure people completed the census because the stakes are that high uh, for our community. So I'm really, um, really looking forward to, to this conversation, uh, particularly because of the news that came out about uh, New York State census numbers uh, for for 2020. Uh, but to do that, uh, I would like to bring to the floor Dr. Richard, uh, I'm sorry, that's his brother, uh, John Flatto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a lot of Flattos. <laughs> yes, uh, Dr. John Flatto is a scholar active who has worked in at the intersectionality of voting rights, election reform, the census, legislative redistricting, black home and business ownership and foreclosure, minority health disparities and criminal justice reform. For decades, he has helped shape political districts and representation that empowers communities of color, amplifying their voices at congressional, state and municipal levels. He is an expert on demographics, racial inequality, socioeconomic status, political dynamics and policy prescriptions. Uh, he is has many hats at Mega Evers College uh, and has argued cases in front of the US Supreme Court. And whenever anyone has said, well, we need to look at the numbers and look at the maps, so you've got to call Dr. Flatto because he can walk you through all of that. So uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to you. Uh, to bring us up to speed on where we are uh, with, the, with the census redistricting and what does that mean for our communities and for our state. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly, for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, and thank the, outs I wanna thank the outstanding leadership of uh, Delta Sigma Theta, Staten Island chapter, my colleagues on the panel, Council Member Brooks Powers and Nicole, we've worked on a couple of uh, census rounds together. Um, I also want to honor uh, two family members. My grandmother was a Delta more than 100 years ago at Howard University, and my mother was a Delta at uh, University of California more than 80 years ago. So giving honor to the women in our in our house who have who are holding up the banner for us all. Um, I wanted to. Uh, oh, let me also a special announcement. Uh, hot uh, Mega Rivers College news flash. We now have a new president, the first woman president in the history, 50 year history of Mega Rivers College, Dr. Patricia Ramsey. So be on the lookout for President Patricia. Ramsey. Uh, 
and then finally, I do, I, before going to uh, census and redistricting, uh, there was uh, a last discussion about ranked choice voting. And uh, I don't want to let our uh, policymakers off the hook. There is actually a snag right now that can sabotage uh, ranked choice voting next month if it's not taken care of. It's my understanding that as of a few days ago, the State Board of Elections has not yet approved the software that the New York City Board of Elections, I just served there for five years, so I know how that bureaucracy works. That software is not yet uh, green lighted so that we can have an efficient count once those deadlines pass all the absentee ballots, military ballots are in. Look at con uh, a council member, almost made her a congresswoman, a little premature there. Council member powers, look how long it took the board just to handle one race, one city council race. If they don't get that technology in order, multiply that by 51 council districts, four borough presidents race, races, and three citywide races. So I'm, I'm sending up a flag right now that we, the advocates, need to get to our, our state legislators in particular. By the way, we, the chairs of the two election law committees, come straight out of Brooklyn. <laughs> state Senator Myrie chairs the Senate Election Law Committee. Assembly member Latrice Walker chairs the Assembly Election Law Committee. Somebody needs to be nudging the State Board of Elections to make a decision immediately so that the City Board of Elections is ahead of the curve, uh, off the runway already, to use the council members term, to make sure that there will be an efficient and quick counting of all those ranked choice ballots when they come in, or we could be sitting around till July or August waiting to find out. Uh, who won that June primary. So heads up, a word to the wise. Now I'm going to um, uh, share screen and talk about um, redistricting and census. By your lead. So what is redistricting? Redistricting is the redistribution of political power, money, and public policy. And how is that done? It's actually done by redrawing the existing political boundaries. Think of redistricting as the redistribution of power, money, and policy. One of the concepts or terms you'll probably hear frequently as the process unfolds is called gerrymandering. There was actually a governor, Jerry, in Massachusetts 200 years ago who approved that crazy looking district on the right hand side of, of your screen there. And uh, as a sop to him, that term gerrymandering was invented. It's actually the last name of Governor Jerry, and he approved a district that looks like a salamander. So that's where that term comes from. And there are uh, several types of gerrymandering, some of which are legal. Uh, they don't help the body politic. They don't help communities, particularly if you're not organized. But some of those terms, some of those uh, uh, strategies are legal, and I'm going to touch on that uh, very shortly. I like so. Uh, following Nicole, this is a uh, a visual test: the reds and the blues. If you look at that column on the left, it's obvious that the blues have the dominant number of squares. You know, you could use your red state, blue state analogy there. And just visually, you can see it's obvious that the blues dominate in column one. And there's a way that you could subdivide or divide up that, uh, that group, that rectangle, in such a way that the blues get all of the subdivisions. And that's the middle column. All you'd have to do is draw some nice, neat lines 
uh, from left to right. And you would see that uh, the blues would have 60% of each of those five districts there. But there's another way, if you look at that third uh, rectangle column, you can actually draw those districts in a way that the reds, even though they're in a minority, they could uh, dominate those five districts. If you look carefully at that, at that last upright rectangle on the right, there are actually more red squares than blue squares in three of the five districts. So there are ways that the minority, even a political minority can draw itself into the majority. And that's part of the underlying political manipulation uh, that goes on in the, uh, in the uh, redistricting process. Straight out of, uh, straight out of, not straight out of Brooklyn, straight out of Suitland, Maryland. This is actually an official map straight from the Census Bureau. It's only three years, uh, three years, about three weeks old. This is the official, this is a visual representation of the Census Bureau's official release of congressional, re it's national congressional reapportionment for based on the 2020 census. So we had a 2020 census. There was a national count. It says that in 2020, there were approximately 331 million uh, Americans now in the United States. And by color, this shows you the distribution across of the, that population across the 50 states. Article one of the US Constitution says that that decennial census is used to determine each state's representation in the US House of Representatives. So if you're a purple state on that map, you lost one congressional seat. If you're a white or blank or gray state, depending on what your screen looks like, you're Congressional representation has remained the same as it was in 2010. If you're a light green state, you picked up one congressional seat. That would be Florida, for example, North Carolina, Oregon. And if you're, there's only one dark green state, so they're the sweepstakes winner. The state of Texas has picked up two congressional seats more than it had in 2010. Our concern is that purple New York State, we lost one congressional district between 2010 and 2020. We lost one seat by just 89 census forms out of 20,200,000 New Yorkers. We were 89 census forms short. That's the margin by which we lost an entire congressional uh, seat in the latest sweepstakes. Now, this is uh, this slide is dense uh, because there's a lot of information. I'm going to go through it quickly, and otherwise, it would have taken me another three or four slides. So I've, it's uh, shoehorned together, but I'm going to go through this very quickly. Number one, our position, and when I say our, I'm a stone cold out and out voting rights advocate for people of African descent. God bless the rest of humanity, uh, but that's my starting point. That's my home base. And I happen to know that all of the other racial and ethnic groups, quite frankly, and one of the reasons I'm on this forum are more organized, I believe, than African Americans, not only in New York, in New York City, but even nationally. I'm, I'm tuned in nationally. Asian Americans, the Latinx community, they have groups that are much more organized, I think, to take on this redistricting challenge than we of African descent. 
and we need to step it up. That's why your organization is so important and that's why I'm here. I said an absolute yes when your social action chair, Michelle, uh, grabbed me by the collar and told me I should be here. Um, no retrogression. So the state lost one congressional seat, but do not let us get boxed in where people are talking about one of those seats coming out of our hides. We now have eight Black or Latinx members of Congress in New York State. Even though the state's delegation has been shrinking, our per people of color congressional representation has been increasing. So there should not be any strategy that rationalizes us, we losing a congressional seat. Right now we have Meeks in Queens, we have Clark and Jeffries in Brooklyn, we have Espayat in Manhattan, we have Mang in Queens also, we have uh, uh, Torres in the South Bronx, we have Bowman in the North Bronx, and we have two more members of Congress uh, moving up from there. Mondaire, jo Congress member Jones and Congress member Delgado. That is, we have the largest black delegation of any state in the nation right now. And when the music stops, and there's one chair pulled away. We're from 27 seats down to 26. Make sure that we're not taking a step backwards. Black Latino communities of color throughout New York State should take a back seat to no other group in this negotiation, this high stakes political negotiation called redistricting, which is about to go down. Number two, communities of interest. We must define what our communities are and make it known that we want our communities, our neighborhoods kept together. We do not want them sliced and diced. We don't want the far Rockaways tacked on to Nassau County. Uh, you know, we need to define what our communities are, stake our claim and protect those communities. There are free, re number two, there are free resources. CUNY has a mapping service called Redistricting and You. You can look up the population of any assembly, Senate, or congressional district in the, actually in the entire country. It's sitting right on the CUNY website. It's free, you don't have to buy any software. Start doing the homework for those districts that are of interest to you that you know you're gonna to have to play offense and defense on. Number three, the census, the congressional data has been released. So officially what you see in yellow, New York has increased in population. In 2010, we were 19.4 million. We're now up to 20.2 million. New York state actually gained 800,000 people in population, but we're competing against 49 other states. So that map you previously saw, yeah, okay, we gained 800,000, but Florida gained almost 2 million. That's why they ate our lunch. So we lost one seat and Florida gained a seat. 10 years ago, Florida had less population than New York. So we're competing against the rest of the nation. And I sure hope Here's another, another uh, uh, flag for us to, to put in the sand. We should appeal that count that says New York lost one seat by 89 uh, persons. There should be noise made. We should not accept that and go quietly into the night. There is an official appeals process that can be lodged with the US Census Bureau. Only certain jurisdic jurisdictions have the uh, standing though to make that appeal, but we should not let that uh, go. Um, what that means for Congress is that in 2010, a congressional district was 17, seven 
117,000. That was the size of a congressional district when they were drawn in 2012, when, when then, uh, when council member Powers and I were working for the Senate 10 years ago. Because New York's population has increased, a congressional district is gonna increase by 60,000. The 26 we have now to be drawn will each be 777,000 people. So here's an exercise. We need to look at our current congressional districts, particularly those representing our community, and we're going to find that they are under population by those numbers. So that means they're going to have to expand when those when those congressional districts. By the way, my preliminary look was that only Congressman Jeffries is very close to that 777,000 number. The rest of our congressional districts are less than that. So that means we're going to have to add population to our congressional districts of color going forward. Um, here we go, number four, racial gerrymandering. I, I mentioned it. It still is, it is illegal. You, you, you have to bring a lawsuit under section two of the Voting Rights Act. Prisoner gerrymandering is, is illegal in New York State. Um, and again, only because of the work of the uh, Senate and Assembly uh, last round and this round, they just re, uh, reinstated uh, uh, prisoner gerrymandering, uh, anti-prisoner gerrymandering provision in New York. But every state does not have that, that uh, criteria. Um, and prisoner gerrymandering basically means that you're counting your state prison population the location where the prisons are, not from the permanent address of the prisoners. And in New York State, uh, 10 years ago, over 50,000 state prisoners, Black and Latino, were being counted in upstate communities, uh, helping them to meet their population goals. We A law was put in place so that those 50 some odd thousand, 58,000, I think it was, prisoners were then counted in their original neighborhoods, your Bed-Stuy, your South Jamaica, your Central Harlem, your Mott Haven. So that's what prisoner gerrymandering is. We shouldn't have to worry about that. Political gerrymandering, the Supreme Court, since the 2012 cycle, has said, it's okay. <laughs> they are not gonna weigh in. There have been a number of, of uh, voting rights cases challenging prisoner gerrymandering, I mean, political gerrymandering, where the Democrats tried to screw the Republicans and the Republicans tr tried to screw the Democrats in redrawing their congressional or state legislative lines. They went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, hands off, we're not gonna get involved with that you know, have at it. So political gerrymandering is, is legitimate. There are a number of other criteria we have to look at. I'm on number four still. Vote, some of these I mentioned already. Voting rights uh, uh, criteria still apply. What's left of the Voting Rights Act. That's why you should know that in our national legislature right now, they're trying to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. It's only passed in the House, it is not passed in the Senate. And that's to plug a hole that was made when the Supreme Court um, knocked out a pre-clearance provision in a case called Shelby County, Alabama versus Holder, Eric V. Holder, the US Attorney General. The Supreme Court gutted part of the U.S. Voting Rights Act, which used to require New York to have to submit all of its districts to the Justice Department before it could implement. Gloves are off. New York doesn't have to submit anything anywhere anymore. So we not have to be particularly vigilant, hope that that federal law passes, and if it doesn't, 
there is a backup plan. Our state, our progressive state legislators do have uh, state legislation right now to, to uh, add a New York state. In fact, they're calling it the John Lewis New York State Voting Rights Act. And they're trying to put a preclearance provision back in effect that would be supervised by the New York State Attorney General. All right, so it's a state level backstop given that we just got, we were wiped out nationally 10 years ago by the, by the conservative uh, US Supreme Court. Um, that was number five. I've already covered number five. Number six. Yes, we're in the middle of a blizzard. You're talking about uh, municipal elections in June, but the, everything I'm talking about is already in motion. We're gonna have to multitask. I'm now serving, I spent the last five years uh, on the New York City Board of Elections. And, but I understand uh, where to be and when to be there. So I am now a commissioner of the Independent Redistricting Commission that is gonna redraw every congressional district, state senate district and assembly district, 150 assembly districts, 63 senate districts, 26 congressional districts throughout the state of New York. We're gonna start our public hearings in June, the same time you're voting and working on ranked choice for your local candidates there are gonna be redistricting hearings and you're gonna to have to be ready with your maps, with your map and your wrap, your, your statement of purpose, your, your instructions to our commission as to how you want us to handle the neighborhoods, the communities, the political districts that are important to you. Um, that's, that's what I mean there. And Come January, I'm still in six, chapter 2A of the city charter. The city is going to put its own districting commission together. I served on that 20 years ago. And, and that is going to redraw all 51 of your city council districts. So when council member powers runs again and she's in office, to she's going to have to run again in 2023 because between now and 2023 every city council district in the city of new york is also going to be redrawn so you're going to have to pay attention to that process the mayor and the city council put that 15 member commission together and those games are going to begin i'm i'm sure in january or february of next year Number seven, um, back to my particular, the body I serve on, transparency. We are posting job vacancies for some key positions, um, uh, public engagement staff to, to or help us organize. We have, we're mandated by the state constitution, very similar process to what Nicole mentioned. The voters of New York state put that uh, independent commission in place with a statewide referendum. It actually spelled out 15 locations that we must do public hearings. We're going to start, we're going to do hearings before we draw the maps, then we're going to draw the maps, then we're going to do a second round of hearings. We need staff. The legislature came to our rescue, put a, a $4 million budget in place just in April, and now we're hiring staff and gearing up to do the work that we're mandated to do. Let me, so I mentioned number seven, it's not just a state commission, there's gonna be a city commission drawing city lines. If you're in a county or a town, Nassau County is gonna redraw their county legislative lines. All this redistricting process is kicking in from top to bottom, city, state, local, national. That's what I mean by the blizzard and multitasking. Number eight, participate. You're going to need to focus on all of these elections as well as redistricting activities. 
because this whole game is going to be over in about 18 months. Whether you're paying attention or not, believe me, other powers are paying attention. And there's a lot at stake. Um, on the national level, we sitting here right now, you don't, we don't know whether the Democrats will still be in control of the House and the United States Senate. They have midterm elections next year. Midterm elections on newly drawn congressional lines and the, and the Republicans control the majority of the state governments among the 50 states in America. So what do you think they're gonna be doing while we're either doing or not doing? That, that train is gonna leave the station with or without us. We wanna be, we wanna be in the locomotive car driving that train. Finally, I'll mention that there, there, through our advocacy and activism and all the brilliant attorneys, I just sort of listed a number of uh, voting rights lawsuits that have directly impacting, impacted and changed the course of history in the redistricting process. That first one, yes, that's me. <laughs> that, that lawsuit is, is 40 years old, okay? Every 10 years, smart lawyers, whether it's our NACP Legal Defense Fund and others, they go on the attack. It's time for us to be in offensive mode because believe me, there are forces on the other side. We already know from the voter suppression, the wave of voter suppression legislation in 40 something states that's trying to roll back our voting rights. The second flank is to change those districts, to re-manipulate those districts to, to put us out of power. But we're not going there. Lastly, I'll mention, which I did at the beginning, keep an eye on the Board of Elections because that's the body that's going to implement everything we're talking about. After the lines are redrawn, they're going to run the elections on those new lines. They're going to set up the election process. So those are uh, some of the key points uh, I wanted to touch base on. Your voice is your vote. It empowers our communities. Redistricting, the redistribution of power, money, and public policy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Flato. Um, I had a, a question that uh, came to mind while you were speaking. You know, we are, you know, barring a, a successful appeal, we are slated, New York State is slated to lose a congressional district. Do you think or do you anticipate that that um, change in population will mean that we will also lose an assembly and a state senate? Uh, district as well? New York will not lose overall. There will still be 150 assembly districts, but you're raising a very good point. We only have the overall count. We know that there are now 20.2 million New Yorkers, but they're going to release a second set of data in August, the U.S. Census Bureau. And that's going to tell us down to the census block and tract level where we may have gained or lost population. So just because New York State is up overall, that doesn't mean that that Central Brooklyn's population count is going to be up or Queens. So your question is very important. It, when we get the next set of numbers, it could show that Central Brooklyn has less population. Therefore, it could lose a state Senate district or an assembly district or even a congressional district. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I, I, I like to call it the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. Clark Jeffries Meeks. These are three black members of Congress in adjacent districts. If we have a major, if we have a major population loss shown with the 2020 numbers, we could wind up with two congressional seats where we currently have three. That would be a worst case scenario. So the jury is still out, but we're gonna know in about another 
what is it? 60 days, 90 days, the answer to your question. Where, where are some seats gonna be lost in the assembly, the Senate? And by the way, council member powers, city council as well. It's gonna affect every political district once we get that second set of numbers from the Census Bureau. Mm -hmm. So in preparation for the lines uh, or beginning of the conversation of what the lines should look like uh, at the congressional level, um, how can uh, everybody watching prepare to, uh, to have their voice heard? And you mentioned some, some key dates coming up uh, in June and you know, have your map and, and your wrap together. So what, what should people be prepared to talk about? What should they be aware of uh, going into these conversations? Because we wanna make sure that you know, everyone who is, is watching is prepared to raise their voice for their community. So any um, you know, talking points or, or framework or thinking uh, that people should start uh, working on would be greatly appreciated. So one, one uh, important concept is COI, community of interest. And you could take that from micro to macro. You could take the position that, well, I'm living, I'm a fourth generation resident of Crown Heights. So I don't know about the rest of what that professor's talking about, but I want to make sure they don't slice Crown Heights up into three assembly districts or four assembly districts, which is what it is right now, by the way. So you can, you should look, you can start as locally as you want and define what your community is, what makes it a community. And it's not just ethnicity or race, right? It could be the schools, the faith institutions, uh, the, the transportation system that knits together, you know, a, a whole swath of neighborhoods. You need to define what that is and be prepared to, in your words. Don't worry, they're gonna be sociologists and political scientists and lawyers. They're all gonna come in with their rhetoric. You need to come in very strong with your civic, your voice, your community voice, and say, this is our neighborhood, this is our community, we want it kept intact, and we want it in one assembly district or, or two. What, that's your decision, that's your conversation to have within your circle, but have a position so that when these hearings come up, I'm gonna be on the other side of the table. You can walk into that room and say, well, we're from Staten Island and, um, this is these are this is our district and we want these changes by the way you might want some corrections made to what you've been living under for the last 10 years your district your neighborhood might be sliced and diced right now and you want it to be made whole so you need to look at your geography your neighborhood don't 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 have to think in in too complicated terms and don't let and don't let the quote experts double talk you out of your freedom <laughs> and your power by telling you, well, you really can't do this because of that and that and this. No, you need to have your own meetings with your own authentic <laughs> indigenous leadership and you decide the position you wanna take and then be prepared to present that. And there's, there's mapping software, but you could just take a paper map and draw a line around it and walk in. Whatever you bring to a public hearing is gonna be an official transcript and part of the record. And believe me, it will have an impact. Those pieces of paper that you submit, that those files could be going all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United. My case went all the way up, I should, my, uh, the Royal We, Flateau. I was the executive director of the court Black and Puerto Rican caucus. So I was the tip of the spear for 26 Black and Hispanic legislators who sued Anderson. You know who Anderson was? He was the Republican Senate majority leader 40 years ago. Now we also had the governor as a defendant in that lawsuit and I wasn't the only plaintiff there. We had a Black plaintiff, a Latino plaintiff. We had a Staten Island plaintiff. We had the husband 
of assembly member Elizabeth Connolly. Robert Connolly was one of the co-plaintiffs in the Flacto lawsuit that went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And we won that case because not only were communities of color being screwed, the, the, the Republicans didn't want to redraw the lines because there was such a dramatic population shift and increase in our favor. And they were trying to argue that, well, we don't have to change those lines now. We could do it later. And the Supreme Court kicked them to the curb. Justice delayed is justice denied. No, you better draw those lines now or we will appoint a special master to draw them for you. That's how far this thing can be taken if we're, if we're armed with, with information, you know, passion. We know what, what's ours and we're prepared to defend it, articulate it, and talk about it. You know, grab a professor if you can, but everybody I've seen on this panel so far, I know I'm very impressed. <laughs> All intelligent and, and expertise is good but we can handle this and we need to get moving. We need to get moving. Wonderful, thank you um, for that. I think that really gives people something to think about as, as how they can prepare. Um, in our last uh, few moments, and again, if you have, if you're watching and you have questions, please drop them into the chat so we can uh, put them to our panelists. But um, my last question uh, to Dr. Flateau is, um, who's actually drawing these lines? A lot, uh, these lines are being drawn in a lot of rooms, believe me, and on a lot of computers. So um, just the body that I serve on is a 10 member commission. Uh, it was appointed by, I was appointed by the Senate Majority Leader, uh, the Honorable Andrea Stewart Cousins. So the minority and majority leader in the assembly and Senate each appointed two, two times four is eight. And then each of our cadres appointed one more. So that's how we came up to 10. So at least on paper, <laughs> we are the official body that's gonna draw the first set of lines. At least we're only doing again, state assembly, state senate and Congress. We then, after we have to do public hearings. Then the state legislature gets to respond to our maps. If they don't like our maps, we have to go back and redraw them again. If they still don't like our maps, we get kicked to the curb and the legislature is gonna take over. Now, remember I mentioned lawsuits. Anybody though can bring a lawsuit and, and throw a monkey wrench in the whole process. <laughs> you know, once you get a judge involved, now you've got an, a whole nother party that's gonna sit there and they could take away the power of the legislature from drawing its own lines. It's been done in the past and it could happen. The reason I put those suits down there, that Cuomo was the 2012. Favors v. Cuomo, and as in the current governor, he was the named defendant in that lawsuit then. So the, the legal, the, uh, the civil rights groups can get involved, community group, they're gonna look for you as plaintiffs, okay? Uh, a lawyer can't, can't bring a lawsuit in their own name. They have to go find individuals who have standing okay, to represent the interest that they're trying to litigate. So the judicial branch can play a major role. If, if the politicians are smart, they're gonna listen to the communities because they would rather, um, they would rather accommodate you on the front end than get sued by you and then lose total control of the process, have it taken out of their hands. Okay, so there'll be a lot of hand, there'll be a lot of pens, a lot of cursors, a lot of computers trying to draw lines, but don't let all of these other groups talk you out of your own districts, your own power. You need to, we need to have our own sense of what our communities are, what needs to be protected, what districts we think we're entitled to, 
have drawn so that we have an opportunity to elect the candidates of our choice. Those are, that's the kind of thought processes we should be working with. But believe me, there, there are already articles out there where people are already putting maps out there. Who are these right. people? You know, right? You've seen them. They don't speak for us, you know, but they will if we don't. Mm -hmm. Well, on, on that note, um, thank you so much, Dr. Flato, Nicole Yearwood, Council Member Sylvina Brooks Powers for, for being part of this really important conversation about ranked choice voting, what that means for the electorate and preparing for redistricting and reapportionment. Uh, in 2020 and 2021 and 2022. Uh, uh, thank you again to the uh, alumni chapter of Staten Island's uh, Delta Sigma Theta. I uh, want to bring back uh, our May week chair, Edwina Martin, uh, to close us out. Unmute. Okay. I think I got to work now. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> um, so I was just saying thank you so much for your wonderful moderation. Thank you to all of our amazing panelists tonight. What a powerful program this was. Uh, I'm so glad that we streamed it live on Facebook so that any folks that missed it can go to the Staten Island Alumni Chapter Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated Facebook page and catch it um, on replay anytime you want. So please continue to share it with your friends. Um, this is critically important information. I remember after the results 